Welcome to Rise Above Performance Train's 15 Minutes of Strength, the show where we explore and discuss the vast landscape of strength to help you live your best and strongest lives. I'm your host, Doug Fiorinelli, and this is Episode 10, A Strength Journey with Cerebral Palsy, Overtime with Trainer Tevin Cherry. All right, welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have a special guest, Tevin Cherry out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, he is a phenomenal human being and strength athlete who has uh, had cerebral palsy since he was nine months old. And he his fitness journey through Instagram has really inspired me to reach out and get him on the show just so I can learn more about what he's doing, not only with his training, but what he's doing to help other people out. So Tevin, welcome to the show. Hey, hey. All right. Glad to, uh, glad to be on. Oh, yeah. No, I'm excited about this. Um, yeah. Give it, everyone, you know, a little one minute breakdown of who you are and uh, kind of what what your training philosophy is and, and we'll kind of take it from there. Uh, my name is Tevin Cherry. I'm 30 years old out of Atlanta, Georgia, but I was born in Thomaston, Georgia, uh, November 2nd, 1991. I developed a passion and love for fitness and strength training through um, loving gym growing up as a child. And now I am a personal trainer slash movement rehab rehabilitation coach. And my desire is to help people move freely, move strongly and get over or out of whatever pain they're going through. That's great. I, I've read your website and everything and, and it looked like you're, you have cerebral palsy and it's um, kind of detected at birth or is it shortly after birth? What was your initial diagnosis? After a few months of my parents just watching and listening to the doctors about the developmental milestones, uh, my mom noticed that I wasn't sitting up when I wasn't completing the milestones at the same pace as my twin brother. So at the age of eight or nine months, my parents took me to the Marcus Center that now diagnoses com uh, commonly autism now, and it was there at the Marcus Center where I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Probably something like your your lower body, just not the strength wasn't there to help you sit up or starting to crawl or something like that is kind of the how they figured it out that there was something um, there with that. Yeah, we, well, what generally happens is there's the, um, the cerebral cortex in the brain that controls movement. That uh, was negatively affected, uh, negatively affected during the uh, gestation period at which, you know, at which I was still inside, developed and inside my mom. So that has a um, direct correlation to premature birth, and that's mainly how um cerebral palsy manifests itself it seems like the um the condition is when i was looking up and doing research it's not super common i think it was like one in two hundred thousand. so at the time and it, it was about 30 years ago what were they doing after the diagnosis did they was there special programs they can get into or you know to help parents out obviously you know it's it's people just don't know i wouldn't know what to to do with somebody, I have to find resources. I imagine 30 years ago, there was, there was less of it too as well. So what, what was kind of your initial things that your parents did to help you out and to get you progressing forward? Well, 30 years ago, there was pretty much physical therapy and occupational therapy and things of that matter. So I had to go through a lot of that. And for those who don't know what occupational therapy is, occupational therapy is about developing your motor skills, how to use your hands, how to cut with scissors, how to button your shirt, everyday um, everyday life skills. So I had to go through tenuous rounds of that. And I can even remember my handwriting not necessarily being legible until I was about in the second grade and I couldn't cut anything without uh, messing up or fraying the lines until like the fourth grade. Even tying my shoe by myself was difficult and I didn't do that until about the eighth grade. So, Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And then how long were you um, participating in some type of physical therapy and occupational therapy program. Are you still doing it now or are you just kind of doing it on your own now that you've learned a lot more? 
I'm doing it on my own a lot more, and but um, for the most part, I participated from I want to say kindergarten all the way up to high school, but then got to a point where my parents couldn't afford physical therapy. So now I'm in college. Now I'm trying to take care of myself and really uh, take ownership and advocate for myself as far as building my body. And when I went on YouTube and various mediums of um, resources for information, as far as working out with somebody in my condition, I couldn't find anything. So what I did was I watched strength training videos. I watched uh, mobility videos and I just tried to study what they did. And then I would put my own little spin on it. And then I would start recording videos of me working out basically on social media and through the various platforms, I was able to share my story and kind of build some type of platform based off of me working out and things of that nature. And as I've gotten progressively stronger, I've uh, stumbled upon various methods that have been able to really help me, such as uh, go to movement systems, original strength. And I've partnered with some amazing people like uh, Mark Liebert over the years and um, Carl Pioli. And I have a little bit of a CrossFit background, thanks to him. So. Yeah, that's great. I I definitely want to explore that a little bit more. But let's go back a little bit because you said you were in the gym or you love fitness even at a young age. What motivated you then to do that? Was it to help you out, or just you enjoyed sports, or you saw siblings doing those things and you enjoyed doing that and got you into the gym or got you into you know participating in athletics and physical training? Basically, when I really think about it, I really grew up in a gym setting. My parents, they used to coach uh, rec league basketball, and my brother and sister were on the team. I didn't play sports back then, but it came to be about the summer of fourth grade going into fifth grade. My mom bought me and my brother a weight set so we could work out at home, and my brother started to lift weights and get into football, Again, I didn't play football, too afraid to get hit. But, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, but uh, ninth year came around, and one of the administrators, his name was Shad Seymour, he recommended that I try out for the wrestling team. And I got beat pretty badly, but when I was finally able to get into the weight room my junior year, well, I wrestled from my freshman year to my senior year, uh, but I finally got into the weight room my junior year, and that really, the weight training built my esteem and my body image. I started to look strong, commonly with cerebral palsy. We're associated or stigmatized as being weak. So me building my body helped me build my self-esteem, and it also improved my appearance and my self-confidence in myself. Yeah, I think that's very important. I mean, weight training in general does that for a lot of people. And I, I always take that philosophy with people too. Like, you know, I train some athletes, even young guys, and, you know, some of them may not go to play in college, but I, I want to help them build the skills and also to have confidence, right? They take that skill with them that they always have. And whether it's, you know, just, you know, having cerebral palsy or even just having, other things like, you know, negative self-esteem or just need to lose a little bit of weight. I think, I think that helps. And I'm glad that that helped you out too, you know, um, with the, with the weight training now before the weight training and before maybe the wrestling, you're doing your physical therapy. How was the progress with cerebral palsy? Like did doctors give you new milestones to achieve, or is it kind of unpredictable in a sense that they it, it's kind of person by person in terms of what they can accomplish or goals they can achieve with uh, cerebral palsy going forward as people age. It was really um, un unpredictable, but it's like the doctors threw out this diagnosis of, oh, maybe he won't be able to do this, that, and the third. And my father, shout out to my father, he just basically was like, we understand that we're just going to take him home and figure figure everything else out. You know, I understand you're a doctor and everything, but 
you know, what you're saying about my son is not the end all be all. So I'm thankful that I had a collect collaborative effort from my parents and my siblings to say, Hey, he might have this, but we're going to teach him how to do this so he can navigate the world because one day we're not always going to be there to help him, but we're going to give him the tools and the skills necessary so that he can succeed. And that's pretty much what they did. No, that's great. Uh, Having support like that is, is key. I think, especially at a young age, right? You need, you need that. And you also, you had the, not only their support emotionally, but also the, the gym and their physical prowess to, to help you get going in, in the right direction. So I, I can see that be, being frustrating and easily kind of lost, right? So that's, that's great. So as you get through high school and wrestling, you, then you started looking outward to find places and you couldn't, in terms of training, so you didn't find really anything on cerebral palsy for, for weight training. Yeah, I can imagine that would be tough, but I know original strength is great. There's a lot of mobility work. Did you, you find that the mobility work is uh, kind of essential to where you're at now? Yes, that's that's pretty much my niche, uh, the mobility work and things of that nature and really trying to figure out the body and where I need to place all of my emphasis or trying to open my hip, trying to activate or put more energy or pressure into my feet and things of that nature. So getting back down to the ground and really exploring the hunter and gatherer um, mentality, that's really helped me build or build up a strong base that I didn't necessarily get to continue to build on with uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy and whatnot. So now I'm just in a phase of where I'm just figuring out my body and using exercising and training to stave off some of the aging that comes with cerebral palsy because we are limited in movement somewhat and we don't always have the opportunities to get out. But I try to make sure that I use fitness as a medium to stay active and also encourage others to transcend whatever they're overcoming in their very situations. When you're doing, let's, let's say a mobility drill, like when I do a mobility drill and I'm using original strength, I, you know, I recommend people if they haven't checked them out, just check them out. They're basically the original strength is our prime primal movements, like um, what toddlers and things would use that we kind of get away from that they kind of bring back like rotation, hip work, hip rocks. Um, you know, I do those daily just to help myself out. And obviously Tevin's a big proponent of that. Um, when I do them and I find limitations, I feel like I hit a brick wall, but I can feel the sensation. It's like, oh man, my hips are tight at this angle. I got to just kind of constantly rock there. And then hopefully over time, my joint will loosen up, my muscles and tendons will loosen up and I'll be able to get more out of it. Is that a feeling that you get, or is there a connection like the brain and the the limb, like there's the neuromuscular connections not there and you're trying to get it wired. Whereas like getting feeling in the feet or getting feeling in, um, you know, the limbs or the joints, is that kind of, what do you feel in terms of that versus, you know, what I can feel when I'm doing them? There's a wall that I hit. And then there's also, um, so it's like a coin. Coins have two sides to them, correct? Yes. So there is a wall that I hit and in the same sentiment, I'm still trying to figure out the uh, pathway to discover, to get everything to connect. As uh, I put up a picture or a video the other day, or I was working out the other day, just rocking and moving around on the ground. And I was trying to figure out at what point, do I need to shift my body so that I can feel my hip and my foot connect? And I just kept thinking about my thigh and how I had to turn it out so it could be quote unquote externally rotated. And I was able to make that connection between my hip and my foot. So most of my training is not only for strength and speed, it's also awareness because You know, with cerebral palsy, there's a disconnect there, but I'm spending time 
trying to shift and figure out where I can get that connection and just stay in that connection. And once I work or shrink, shrinking the movement down, quote unquote, and just focus on micro movements, eventually over time, the movement will show itself in full expression, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. You do practice standing and walking. I've seen that, which is great. Do you have a, like a sensory between the ground and your upper body, like moving together, or is there like a, a sensory, like disconnect that helps, you know, kind of limits the balance. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like if there's like in certain positions, you can't feel the legs or, or, you know, underneath you for balance, or is it more just the, the strength of the legs that need to get back and that connection to kind of recruit the muscles to help you do the movement? It's really the strength that really needs to get back. Now, when I first started practicing walking on a regular basis, there was a point where I couldn't really feel my lower extremities and I, I couldn't really tap into the shift of the weight as I moved from one side to the other. But as I've gotten stronger and as I've gotten, you know, that, you know, that awareness that we went back, that we're going back to before, as my awareness has heightened, you know, I can tell myself, hey, I need to shift over here. Or, hey, you need to shift back a little bit over here and you need to slow down so you can really feel that foot go into the ground. You really need to focus on picking up your feet and not dragging your feet so much so that you can uh, walk a little bit cleaner. And over time, I've gotten faster and stronger and my awareness has increased. Oh, that's great. Um, I, I, I hear a couple of good things. Uh, what I really like and and I think um kind of exemplified or kind of what my fitness journey has been you know we did did sports growing up and hit the weight room probably a little bit later in life but then you know did the same thing our parents bought a set and we did it at home and we were just trying to lift to get big and you know play sports but now as I get older you know I have had some injuries as well nothing crazy but just some knee stuff and whatever but I'm really what I'm seeing from you or listening from you is a true focus in training where we're not so much worried about the resistance. We're, we're more concerned on the, the movement itself and also the reaction of the body to that movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, I'm really kind of liking what you're saying with that. When did you kind of, I assume that when you did this, like your body started making changes a little bit more rapidly, whether because you're focused on these things, when did you start tapping into that and realizing you know, when we see things on YouTube, it's like, oh, that's really cool. That guy's doing that. But, you know, the steps to get there, but also the conscious movement that needed to to get to certain places. When did you start applying that sort of thing into your training? I want to say around 2018, 2019. Relatively new phenomena for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I had gotten into a place where all of my extreme games were starting to plateau and I had gotten bored you know mm -hmm. I'm the type of person where I need to constantly be challenged to stay motivated and then after I just discovered original strength I discovered um VLS training quote-unquote go to movement and their systems they kind of overlap and I was kind of able to get a little bit more of a deeper understanding as far as how the central nervous system works and some of the movement patterns from a uh, GOTA. And I was able to transfer and make the connection between GOTA and original strength. And then once I started learning up under the, the GOTA tree and studying from what I had already picked up from original strength, I was able to make the connections and I was like, Oh, okay from what they're saying and what original strings is saying, they correlate and they go hand in hand in a sense. And, you know, go to, they place more of an emphasis on the foot and the ankle and making sure everything is properly aligned and whatnot. And they have the same um, importance on primal movements and the crawling and the baby and things of that nature. So uh, this journey has been, a long one for me, but <laughs> I enjoy it because I'm learning each and every single day more and more 
and the more I learn, the more I'm able to help um, other people. Yeah, that that was a lot newer than I thought, like in terms of 2019 wasn't too long ago um, in terms of just, yeah, starting to focus on the 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 training that way that that's pretty impressive because i've seen you do some strength stuff i mean i've seen you do handstands and whatnot her upper body is like pretty darn strong man i i can't even get anywhere near that but that's pretty impressive but yeah i'm glad you found the other um methods so what things that you got out of the the goda and the original strength that you're kind of like we all go oh man i wish i knew this earlier so let's take you know a young kid maybe 15 16 that has some issues with lower extremities or balance and what would you do to get them going right away without overwhelming them that maybe t- to help accelerate their, their progress. I've often said this in the past and it's like now reflecting back with original strength and go to, I really wish um, when I was younger and in physical therapy and this period all around, I wish I would have focused on crawling a lot more. Because I really felt like if I focus on crawling a lot more, even past, uh, even past high school and things like that, I feel like I would have been able to incrementally build myself up stronger to even, even, even from where I am presently at this point. And a lot of people may say, hey, you were strongest in your 20s and you're starting to fall off. I feel like it's the opposite for me. I say that I'm much stronger now than I was in my 20s when when I was jacked and my body looked like <laughs> <laughs> I was I was ripped, you know, but yeah. I didn't have the awareness and I didn't have the uh wherewithal that I have now. So I'd say that I'm much more mature and I have a higher sense and more keen sense of awareness. And I'm thankful for where my body is now compared to where I was at in my twenties. No, I agree with you. If you, if you have trouble in your twenties getting in shape, then, you know, there's really no hope because that's like your prime years of, you know, just being strong. I, I was the same way. I'm, I'm, I've had to change a lot of things, you know, I'm, I'm 45, so I got some years on you, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, some injuries and stuff have, have crept up, but I, I'm trying to, like, I, I too have got an original strength and, um, you know, gold medal bodies, GMB fitness, they, I've done a lot of their stuff just on my own. And I've gone to one of their seminars and they, they emphasize a lot of the stuff there. And I try to do a little bit of that every day. And, that's been helping me out. Cause yeah, you, you got to shift your focus. Like I had to cut down on the way, like I don't care about weight so much anymore or, or volume. I just try to do a little bit every day and, and focus on the movement and getting better. Cause I want to, you know, I want to, the twenties, I don't looking back, like, you know, you, you should feel good in your twenties, but how am I going to feel in my seventies? Right? Like I want to make sure that I feel okay in my seventies and I can still move around and, and whatnot. It was interesting. I, I wouldn't have picked the crawl. I, I get I get the crawl, like this effectiveness, but why can you elaborate a little bit more on why crawling you wish you did more of earlier? I know it's a it's a kind of a developmental milestone and it's a big keystone movement in in both original strength and even GMB. I haven't explored Gota very much. I'm gonna look into it after this, but elaborate a little bit more on why crawling is so important for people in general. Crawling is important because if you look at it, crawling is essentially walking on the ground and it really teaches you how to connect your body properly. Like you bring your right, your right arm forward in conjunction with your left foot. And just that whole connection of how the body is wired. It's really, um, it really connects your body and makes it whole and crawling challenges not only your arms and your legs, but also your core. And crawling, it really focuses you to concentrate and really work on bringing the body all together and integrating everything into one. So that's why I say that if I knew now what I knew back then, I definitely would have crawled a little bit more. Yeah, I I agree. I, and I, I'm glad you brought the contralateral movement because um, I noticed even for myself when I started doing those, 
how quickly our body forgets it, or we can do one side and then we can't do the other. So for people that don't know, a contral out of movement is, is moving, let's say your left arm and your right leg um, at the same time. And that wiring of the body tends to leave us. So, you know, some, I've seen it with some of my clients, you know, the, we do, we'll do like dead bugs and bird dogs and stuff like that. And I'll see one side that works pretty well. And the other side, they have to, I can see steam coming off their head, trying to think about how to move their right arm and their left leg at the same time. Um, and those things, those skills tend to go and they, I don't want to say they look remedial, I mean, they are remedial in a sense, but, you know, people tend to not uh, kind of discount those movements. And I think they're, they're very important. I find myself going back to those and trying to integrate those with people's training as well. Um, the other one was rolling. Do you do much? I, I've seen you do some, do you some rolling like front to back and stuff? I, I've seen that being hard for, for me on one side and, and the other side being a little bit smoother. And that's very kind of primal with the original strength. I don't know if they do that in Gota much, but right um i wish i stayed in a bigger space so i could roll more so i don't roll as much as i used to but back when i had a larger space i was able to roll a lot and for long periods of time and rolling really helped me um strengthen the core and it really helped me figure out my spatial awareness and how to use my eyes and how to how to tactile i mean you know, get more in touch with the tactile system, the system of touch and uh, really help me use my eyes and help me to track information and really get the, the proprioceptive nerves and everything working and all in sync. So once I get into a larger space, I'll definitely be rolling a lot more. And plus, rolling is good for the spine, and it really settles the central nervous system down. But not, not too many people know that. That's why babies roll a lot. You know, it it relieves a lot of stress, and it takes a lot of stress off. Yeah, I was I always wonder why we get away from those things. I don't know if it's our it's probably our environment, right? We start sitting in school and and doing other things, and even sports. A lot of them are. Uh, different the movements are different you know we get we get away from the primal stuff and you know even football and wrestling's a little more pure i would say in terms of natural movement but you mm -hmm. know i i played a lot of soccer and we didn't use our upper body at all you know so we had to try to keep our upper body strong you know i i train kids in soccer that can't even hold weights doing step ups because they get tired too quickly you know so it's just what? yeah they just get you know they just don't have any upper body strength because they're so used to running and kicking trying to get get the body balance is, is tough sports are definitely tough on the body mm -hmm. that, that's all great stuff um I, I see i see the good thing you have a good you had a good foundation with your parents helping you out the physical therapy and being having access to a gym and then now finding your strength journey just to to get better and to help people out what what keeps you motivated because i imagine you know, just like anybody else, maybe even, even more, a little more so is just getting frustrated with lack of progress. Was that your drive to get, to get better? Cause you said you did plateau a little bit. Um, but yeah, what keeps you, what keeps you going and, or what, yeah, things that you have found to help you go and, and keep persisting and, and getting, getting better. Working with, um, working with, my clients on a consistent basis, seeing what issues they have. And I'm always on the internet searching for different modalities to help them out to make sure that, you know, as I take them through sessions, I'm giving them the best opportunity to improve. And I also um, follow a group of moms whose children have CP and, they watch my stuff and they, they support, you know, my brand, you know, with my merchandise and things like that. I have a couple moms that I DM from time to time, you know, just checking on the child and things of that nature. And they always hit me back with so-and-so hit this milestone. And that really keeps me going because regardless of how much money I make from my training journey and all that, you know, it's important because I have to survive and live. But the more important thing is I put out content so that the next generation and the next generation of child with cerebral palsy or any other similar disability, I want them to have a blueprint and I want to be able to um, 
I want them to be able to study what I was able to do and then improve upon it so that their quality of life has a chance to be better. No, that's great. Let's say we have a young man or woman or young lady that has cerebral palsy. They're, they're 12 years old. They're starting to look for ways to get better. What, and they come across you, what would be maybe the three things that to get them going to help like that you wish you knew or things that you, that they can do right now to get better and, and see progress that maybe you've seen like kind of a general, I know people are different and, and the condition can be different in anybody, but like you talked about the crawling, um, are there like two other things that people can do like right away to be like, wow, I, okay, this is, it's working. I can see gains and I, I keep some going to get better as they progress in age. Um, number one, I would always look at where they currently are and see what their potential is. Of course, if they were um, confined to a wheelchair, I wouldn't necessarily want to put them on the ground because they're not used to being in that setting. So I would have to create a, an adaptive workout and really see how well their motor skills were and just work from there and be able to build a program so that they can have adaptable exercises for their position and for whatever condition they're in. And then I would also have to communicate with them directly as to what their goals are, because I have different goals as me being, but as a trainer, I have to understand my client's goals. Secondly, if they were, more like me, so so to speak, I would put them on the ground. I would teach them um, the child rockers. I would um, I would get them to teach them how to use the wall and how to depend on various supports and whatnot because support is necessary. I wouldn't necessarily take them through a heavy weightlifting regimen because. I have to make sure that their structure is strong enough to handle that. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So it would be a lot of um, groundwork and foundational stuff. And as they progress, I would continue to build my program from there. Mm-hmm. And That's three, right. and three, I would always make sure that I affirm and continue to assess and let them know that they can do this. And if they can't, we're going to re, uh, we're going to sh- we're going to sh- shrink the movement or whatever we're trying to do, and we're just going to work within the micro milestones and just continue to build until they can get to where um, they want to be, so to speak. So it would have to be a collaborative effort. But those are the three things that I would focus on. Uh, that's great. No, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. So, what's next for you? You you have some uh, some goals that you want to reach, and or something that are close. So give me some short term, some long term, and then uh, just talk a little bit about your your training as we kind of wrap up here. Like what what kind of services you offer, and you can pitch your your social media and your. I'm getting a t shirt. I'm excited about it. That's coming in the mail. <laughs> So, thank, thank you. Of course. It looks cool. You got a cool design, man. And the colors, I'm like, oh man, my colors are boring. So your, your color is really nice. Thanks, man. My training services, I typically work with uh, strength training clients, mobility clients, and anyone that's uh, rehabbing from injuries. I help people generally who have uh, Lo- uh, injuries associated with the lower extremities, ankles, feet, uh, MCLs, ACLs, et cetera, et cetera. And you guys can follow me on social media at Buster underscore the underscore strongman. And you can also support by um, one, listening to the Rise Above Strength podcast. <laughs> and you can also Click the link in my bio and check out and purchase a piece a piece of my merchandise. I have stuff for men, women, and I'm basically going to be doing shorts and hats for the summer. So be on the lookout for that. 
And you can also find a link to my personal training services in my bio as well. Yeah. And I'll put all that in the, in the show notes as well, but definitely give him a follow on Instagram. Cause like I said, I ran across it. I either, either one of us, I forgot reached out, you know, and, uh, I've been in, really enjoying his progress, like seeing his progress is motivating for me. And it's like, wow, this is just to seeing what's capable out there. Um, with training with someone that's you know overcome overcoming something and and really experimenting on themselves i mean i think as trainers like we that's what we got to do first and foremost we have to live it too right <laughs> i wish i was 20 again and just like lifted and ate whatever i wanted and, and looked strong but no how do we keep going how do how do we you know live a life of fitness all the way to the end and help people out along with their journey. And it, and it comes through, I think, just our own experiences and just experimenting on ourselves, a little bit of trial and error and and committing to the life of that. So I think that's good. And I, I do think you're doing a good service, especially with cerebral palsy. I, like you said, you when you searched, you couldn't find anything. Is there things out there now beyond yourself that are, that are out there for it? Have you found anything? Yes, yes. In Georgia, um, there is a, uh, there's a gym strictly dedicated to people with disabilities they're called the uh, alternative gym on instagram oh very and cool yes and then there's also the uh shepherd center but i'm not necessarily uh close with the shepherd center like that but the alternative gym they do a really good job with um providing sources and resources for um children with disabilities and they have their own equipment and Angie, the lady that's over the gym, she does a very, very good job. And then it's called special strong and they're all the way out in Texas okay. and their gym is completely adaptive for um, various conditions like autism, cerebral palsy and uh, down syndrome and Daniel, the owner out there, he does a really good job. And I got connected with them through um, NASM, the National Academy of Sports Medicine. So, yeah, it's great. It's coming around. And then hopefully, you know, you can continue to be a pioneer in this. You know, love to see some YouTube videos or something, just tutorials. I think you'd, you'd help out a lot of people, um, not only with cerebral palsy, but just people working with people like that, parents. Um, I think. You know, we even touch upon that too much, but, you know, just helping the parents out too, because sometimes I think they can be overwhelmed with what's going on and, and not know where to start. Right. So, uh, yeah, hopefully you can keep doing what you're doing and, and, and uh, just keep helping people out in that respect. Definitely, definitely. I appreciate you for allowing me to um, be on the platform and I really can't take it for granted. Oh uh, no, the pleasure is all mine. Really, I, I like I said, this is seeing you do what you do, is what it's all about for sure, and that that keeps me going. And uh, I'm really happy to have you on here. Yeah, so thank you for joining me, and hopefully we can have you on again in a few months. And uh, if you got something special to to add, you know, down the road, definitely more than happy to to talk about it. Because uh, yeah, your journey's a really good one, and I recommend people keep an eye on it for sure. Awesome. All right. I want to thank everybody for joining uh, Tevin and I today. Um, hope you enjoyed the episode. You know, feel free to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, check out Rise Above Strength, and uh, you can check out the newsletter. I have a monthly newsletter there, different uh, videos and articles and podcasts like this one. And uh, yeah, stay strong out there. Remember, all the strength you need is on the inside and reinforced on the outside. We'll see you next time, everyone. Thanks.